and welcome to the Pediatric Foundational Series here on the Dietitians and Nutrition Support Channel. My name is Allison Lawrence, and I'm a pediatric dietitian in Southern California, and I'm also a certified nutrition support clinician. In today's video, we're going to be talking all about how to estimate neonatal nutritional needs. So we'll take a deep dive into general considerations for preterm infants, late preterm infants, and term infants. And then we'll also talk about some more condition-specific nutritional concerns with related to some diagnoses that you might see within the NICU. So if you haven't yet seen our previous NICU nutrition video, we actually have two on this channel, one where we go over general NICU terminology, ways to estimate needs, and then also reviewing growth trends of these infants. And then there's also a case study available as well. So please feel free to check out those previous videos if you haven't yet already. So first we'll begin with discussing neonatal fluid needs. And whenever I talk about fluid needs for these patients, I always like to distinguish between what maintenance fluid needs are versus the amount of fluid that's gonna be needed for growth and development. And so maintenance fluid needs are gonna be the amount of fluid that's needed to maintain homeostasis, maintain cardiovascular function, and maintain renal function. And this is gonna be different than the amount of fluid that's gonna be needed to provide optimal calories, protein, and micronutrients to our patients so we can make sure that they're growing appropriately. So infants are taking all of their nutrition through liquid, whether that be breast milk, whether that be formula. And so it's important that it's a little bit higher so we can ensure that we're having optimal nutrient delivery. So initially fluids will be limited in that postnatal period to allow for diuresis and then they're allowed to be liberalized. In general, when we reach full nutrition, our fluid needs are gonna range between about 140 to 200 mLs per kilogram per day for our full enteral nutrition provision. So this is gonna be very patient dependent, whether you have a fluid restricted baby versus a baby that's gonna be taking a lot of formula or breast milk by mouth, and you're exceeding your overall estimated fluid needs, but these are just general, general ranges. We'll then begin with our neonatal nutritional needs for the preterm infant. So preterm infants are born with little to no reserves, they have an increase within their energy expenditure, and are immediately within a catabolic state. So our nutritional provision is really important so that we prevent this catabolism. And in general, needs can be divided into enteral as well as parenteral recommendations. So on the screen, you'll see that we have tables for both enteral and TPN needs, and these recommendations have been published by various institutions. So for enteral, we have Aspen recommendations, we have ESPGIN recommendations from 2022, Texas Children's, C-SPAN, as well as the ESPGIN critical care guidelines from 2021. And then we also have our parenteral needs that are published from Aspen, the NICE PM guidelines, Texas Children's, as well as the ESPGIN critical care guidelines from 2021. And so you might be thinking, why are we including all of these different institutions and what they recommend? And the answer is, is that in my clinical practice, I always feel it's helpful to cross compare different guidelines against one another. So we can see how they're similar, how they differ and make the best well-informed decision for our patients. The next patient population we'll talk about is late preterm infants. So Aspen is actually one of the few institutions that actually differentiates between preterm and late preterm infants and gives recommendations that are specific for the late preterm infant. And these infants are challenged from a nutritional standpoint as they have difficulties with feeding, they might be more prone to episodes of hypoglycemia and have an increased need for respiratory support. So there are recommendations that have been established for both enteral as well as parenteral intakes for these patients. The next patient population we'll talk about is our term infants. So the needs for these patients are going to vary dependent on why they're within the NICU in the first place, why they're needing that intensive care support. But again, at different institutions have published recommendations for enteral as well as parenteral needs. So now that we've talked about our general patient populations of the preterm infant, the late preterm infant, and the term infant, we'll begin to talk about some condition-specific considerations about nutrition when it comes to different diagnoses that you might see within your NICU. So first we'll begin with neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. You might also hear this referred to as neonatal abstinence syndrome or NAS. And babies that have been exposed to drugs intrauterinely experience heightened metabolic demands related to symptoms of withdrawal. And this can cause increase within their muscle tone, tachypnea, hyperthermia, and an increased amount of time that's been awake. And in addition to all of these things, they can also be poor feeders. 
So when it comes to estimating energy needs for these patients, we know that they can be very hypermetabolic. So sometimes they might even require up as high as 150 kcals per kilogram per day, as cited within the literature. In addition, you might need to increase your fortification early, so you might be providing 22 or 24 calorie per ounce because those babies are just burning through those calories so quickly. And when it comes to fluids, we do want to be mindful of the amount of GI losses that we're experiencing, whether they be through diarrhea or vomiting, so we can ensure we're accounting for those fluids and electrolyte losses. The next condition we'll talk about is respiratory distress syndrome or RDS. Respiratory distress syndrome is a diagnosis that's reserved for our preterm infants as it's defined as surfactant deficiency. So surfactant is accumulated within the third trimester of pregnancy and what it does is it allows for our alveoli to increase their surface area to allow for sufficient gas exchange. So in the absence of surfactant, you do see alveolar collapse, which limits the ability to be able to have that gas exchange occur. So these infants are gonna be on your supplemental oxygen. When it comes to looking at energy needs, your energy estimations are very similar to what is recommended for preterm infants for, bro for both parenteral as well as enteral nutrition. Our protein needs are gonna be between about 3.5 to four grams per kilogram per day. Your fluid needs are gonna range between 120 to 150 mLs per kilogram per day. And this will be dependent on whether we're providing full TBN support, a combination of parenteral and enteral or full enteral nutrition. The next condition we'll talk about is bronchopulmonary dysplasia or BPD. BPD is a diagnosis that's a result of lung damage most commonly caused by prolonged mechanical ventilation. And infants with BPD experience increased metabolic demands due to an increased work of breathing, inflammation, and damage to their lungs that results in a need for repair. And unfortunately, growth failure is very common for these patients. For energy needs, they usually require about a 15 to 25% increase within energy needs, or some site in the literature of providing about 135 to 150 kcals per kilo per day. But remember that your total energy expenditure is gonna be related to your respiratory status. So if your infant with BPD is now having an, an improvement within their work of breathing and they're weaning on their oxygen requirements, they might no longer require such high energy provisions. Protein needs are generally a goal of about 3.5 grams per kilogram per day. And the enteral protein goals are similar to what is recommended by ESPGEN. For fluid needs, in general, these babies are going to be fluid limited, especially within the initial periods, to about 135 to 150 mLs per kilogram per day. And our goal is to really prevent fluid overload because this can contribute to pulmonary edema and lead to decrease within their pulmonary compliance and an increase within airway resistance. We then have congenital heart disease or CHD. So neonates with CHD have an increase within their nutritional requirements and are often going to be volume restricted. They experience a heightened energy expenditure, increased infection risk, poor oral intake, feeding intolerance, and also are more commonly diagnosed with malnutrition. And the needs for this patient population vary quite widely as it's gonna depend on the type as well as severity of their cardiac defect. So your fluid might be limited if you have a baby where you're trying to prevent overcirculation, and you might be limited to about 120 to 130 mLs per kilogram per day. For energy needs, you might be aiming about 130 to 150 kcals per kilogram per day, and your protein needs are similar to those that are recommended for both your preterm and your term infant patient populations. The next condition that we'll think about is ECMO. So ECMO is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation and is a form of life support. So infants that are placed on ECMO have an increase within their protein needs that are related to catabolism, and they're also at risk of malnutrition and growth failure. So traditionally, many NICU teams have been apprehensive to providing enteral nutrition while on the ECMO circuit due to concern for not being able to have adequate GI perfusion. And recent literature has shown that we can provide minimal enteral nutrition while they're on the ECMO circuit, of course, depending on the hemodynamic stability of the patient and if we're concerned for having that adequate GI perfusion. In general, there are many differences in the literature that cite what is recommended for energy needs. Some do cite the gold standard as indirect calorimetry, but we do know that the indirect calorimetry is limited to use for patients that are generally greater than 10 kilos, and we know it's very difficult to achieve steady state within infants. You can also consider providing Aspen's recommendations of 100 to 120 kcals per kilogram per day, as well as the neonatal nutrition pocket guide recommends providing minimal metabolic support of about 80 to 100 kcals per kilo per day. 
Protein needs are recommended at three grams per kilogram per day. For your fluid needs, you do need to be mindful of the amount of different types of drips that the patient is on because that is going to constitute a lot of their fluid provision. So oftentimes you'll be working very closely with your teams and your pharmacists in order to create concentrated nutrition support prescriptions. Then have our patients with renal disorders. So the nutritional needs of these infants are going to depend on whether the renal disease is acute or chronic. Energy needs have been thought to be very similar to standard enteral and parenteral recommendations for this patient population. Preterm protein needs are consistent with the preterm goals for both calories as well as protein. And protein needs for term infants are going to depend on the severity of the renal disease. So there is recommendations for chronic kidney disease stage 3, stage 4, and 5, as well as those that are on hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. We also can consider our surgical infants. So neonates have a different metabolic response to surgery than your typical pediatric or adult patient would. They do experience an increase within their energy expenditure, and that'll slowly return to normal within about 12 to 24 hours post-op. In the acute phase following surgery, you can see hyperglycemia as well as hyperlipidemia as surgery can often change our substrate utilization to more of a fat oxidation. Important factors for these infants to consider include the nutritional needs that are needed for wound healing, any post-op infections that they might ex be experiencing, as well as other factors that can contribute to an increase within their energy expenditure. So caloric needs are generally roughly the same about your full-term and your preterm infant considerations, and protein needs are going to be dependent on what is needed for your patient to be able to facilitate that optimal healing in that post-op period. So with that, we'll move into our first case study. So baby boy B is an X33 weaker and four day old infant born to a G2P1 via vaginal delivery. And the baby has been admitted to the NICU for respiratory distress syndrome or RDS. The baby is currently on bubble CPAP and starter TPN was initiated via the peripheral IV with plans to obtain a PIC today. The team is planning to order a custom bag of TPN tonight. So our birth weight was 1,812 grams. Our length was 46 centimeters and our head circumference was 30 centimeters. We are plotting this baby on the Fenton Griff chart because the baby is premature. Our weight is plotting at the 20th percentile with a Z-score of negative 0.84. Our length is at the 77th percentile with a Z-score of 0.73. And our head circumference is at the 30th percentile with a Z-score of negative 0.51. So we are gonna estimate energy needs for goal parenteral as well as enteral nutrition. So for PN, we have decided to go with 85 to 111 kcals per kilogram per day and providing goal protein of 3 to 4 grams per kilo per day. And for enteral nutrition, our goals are about 110 to 130 kcals per kilogram per day, with protein needs ranging between 3.5 to 4.5 grams per kilo per day. Our next case study is baby girl A, who is an X36 weaker and 5-day-old infant born to a G2P1 via vaginal delivery. Maternal history is significant for opioid use disorder with misuse of fentanyl during pregnancy. In the delivery room, the patient was placed on bubble CPAP and transported to the NICU for further management of care. The baby is noted to have tremors and an increase within irritability. Feeds were initiated on day of life one, and as feeds advance, the baby is noted to have multiple loose stools and frequent episodes of emesis. Our birth weight was 2,750 grams with a birth length of 47 centimeters and our head circumference is 32 centimeters. So because this baby is 36 and five day old, we are gonna plot them on the Fenton growth chart with our weight at the 48th percentile with a Z-score of negative 0.04, a length at the 46th percentile with a Z-score of negative 0.1, and a head circumference at the 30th percentile with a Z-score of negative 0.52. So we are gonna estimate baby girl A's needs for goal enteral feeds. So our fluid needs are about 150 to 170, depending on our GI losses and the amount of fluid that we need to provide her with optimal energy and protein. Our energy needs are about 120 to 130 kcals per kilo, but this is just a starting point for us to kind of evaluate because we do know that she is very hypermetabolic and so we want to provide her with a caloric increase. And our protein needs are about 3 to 3.2 grams per kilogram per day. So I hope you enjoyed today's video and please feel free to stick around on this channel for future videos where we talk about all things pediatrics. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Mm -hmm.